in my voice, God, and your word be heard in my words. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. God is good. God is good. What a good, good God we serve. God has given me something to start today for midweek. Y'all know midweek is different than Sunday. Sundays, we're in the middle of a series called Rule Book. Tonight, we are going to start something on midweek. I know I'm only going to get through the foundation. Um, and then if I get through it and still got time, I'm still going to quit because I don't want to get pulled in and we'll be here till midnight. How many of y'all want to stay till midnight? Bless God. <laughs> All the first time visitors said, shh. <laughs> if you got your Bible, we'll be in uh, two places. We're going to be in Romans going to read three verses there, then we'll jump back to Genesis, Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 22 to 25, it says this, very famous, uh, says, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged, say exchange, say I trade a thousand days for one day beside him, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Genesis 25 verses 29 to 34. I'm going to read about an exchange as well. Uh, it says this. It says, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. This isn't even good stew. This is the same old stew. <laughs> this is that same red stew from yesterday. The same red stew you had at lunch, you poured over your rice. The same red stew your wife cooked for dinner last night. This ain't no delicatessen. This ain't no Epicurean delight. This is that same old red stew. Old red beans and rice at Popeye's stew. Hey, give me some of that same old red stew. I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and that same red stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You may be seated. That same red stew. <laughs> Adobo, <laughs> sofrito, <laughs> sazon. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was just the same red stew, man. You know, <laughs> they didn't spice that up. They didn't spice that up. So, so, so what happens? what happens is, there are exchanges that take place a lot of times that are not for our benefit. You go into a store, uh, depending on the store, if they're not like a franchise but a mom and pop stop, after a while they have to put a sign on the register that says no refunds, no exchanges. Because they know that they get the raw deal in the exchange. That you're going to buy what you want, wear it where you take it to, tuck the tag in, and bring it back and try to exchange it. How this brand new shirt musty already? How come it's a makeup stain on the shoulder of this? <laughs> right there, right there, right there. Exchange it. How come the bottom of these shoes is dirty already? Because somebody came and took advantage of the exchange. Walmart, they're just now getting hip to watching themselves on the exchange. You know what happens is, is you despise something that you exchange to get out of your life and you take something in. And, and what I mean by that is, is, is when you make an exchange, the thing you got rid of that you don't have no more, you despise it. Uh, let me give you a biblical example. One of the earliest is uh, Lucifer was the angel of worship. And he made an exchange because there was pride in him. 
he'd rather be like God than be Lucifer. And so, so what happens is he's cast out of heaven. He's no longer the angel of worship. Now he's Satan. And, and so then verse 1, in the beginning God creates the heavens and, and the earth. This is where we come in. Okay, so he creates man. He creates man, and, and what happens when he describes David, when God describes David, he says, I have, found, I have found my servant David, which implies that God was looking for something. The God who owns everything is looking for something. He found it in David. What is it about David? Well, David was a man after his own heart. David was a worshiper. And, and when God created the heavens, he created it to be filled with worship. That Lucifer hovered over the throne room and sang praises to God and followed him on the fiery stones. And now there is a vacancy for worship in heaven. That where he used to contend, enter you, enter me. That we now enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise because there is no hovering angel anymore to make sure the atmosphere is. Y'all good with this? All right. So, 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 so now the, the devil who exchanged his worship despises worship. Hates it that you worship. Which is why one of the reasons when, when he comes to Jesus in the third temptation and says to him, uh, I'll give you this if you bow down and worship me, and Jesus settles the issue of worship, the Bible says the devil left him. Because if you ever walk into a room and your ex is in there, <laughs> and not just in there, I mean, if they was in there looking pitiful and wanting you and sappy and Ashy and dry lip, dry elbow, you know what I mean? Looking like they, they was needed about 37 cent put in their coffee cup. You'd be all right with that. But if you go in and they styling on you, and, 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 and they got they, they new they knew piece, right? And they, and they smile straighter than yours. And they got a six pack. Park the Lambo out front. Cats smell good. You want to date them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what happened is the minute you see that you leave because when you see somebody with, with what is supposed to be yours, you have to get out of that atmosphere. Which is why when we worship and, and truly worship, the enemy is defeated. Our praise steals the enemy. That ain't what I'm talking about tonight. Just saying that we tend to despise the thing we exchanged out of our life. Not that we hate it, but we don't have it anymore, and it, and it hurts us, and so we talk bad about it and, and try to talk ourselves into being okay without it. We learn to live without it. How many of y'all know God is in the giving business? God is in the giving business, and I always say this. Uh, he created the earth, and he gave it to us. He brought up dominion, and then he gave us dominion. And then after we sinned, he gave us Jesus, and Jesus gave his life. And after he rose up, he gave us his spirit because he is, he is a giver. This is who God is. But also, in the most general of terms, this is what Jesus teaches us. Ask. And you should, it's right there. Seek. You're going to find it. Knock. It's going to be open to you. And, 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 and he tells the woman, well, if you had asked, I would have given you rivers of living water. He didn't say I would have sold it to you. I would have bartered with you. I would have traded with you. I would have made an exchange with you. He said I would have given you because God is a giver. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is, he's a giver. That's who he is. God ain't no salesman. Say God is not a salesman. God is a giver. You know, you cannot buy from God what he wants to give you. Anybody ever try to give you money for something you try to give them? You say, look, I want to bless you with TV. They say, well, look, here, take something. It's like, stop insulting me. You cannot buy from God what he wants to give you. And you cannot buy from God what he does not want to give you. It's the, it, because he's not a salesman. This is why we see um, scripture say obedience is better than sacrifice. Because you can't buy from God what you ain't supposed to have. And Saul, the reason the scripture comes up is Saul tried to do that. God said, go, kill all of them. Kill their children, kill their animals, keep nothing alive at all. And so he kills everyone but the king. He slaughters all the animals but the fattest of the, of the, of the herds. And then he builds an altar to God, kills those animals on the altar. And, and Samuel comes and Saul walks up and says, 
praise God, God's been so good to us, blah, blah, blah. And Samuel says, if God's been so good, what's this bleeding of the sheep that I hear? He says, oh, we're making sacrifices to him. He says, obedience is better than sacrifice. It, it, this, this, is, this is not, you can't buy from God what he didn't intend to give you. And, and, and so God ain't a salesman. He's a giver. God is a rewarder. Two people have been rewarded by God in their entire life in a row. <laughs> God is a rewarder. There we go. We get out of here quick if y'all be with me. If, if I got to repeat everything three times, we're going to be here until about 922. <laughs> y'all like 922. Y'all be like, all right. He's a rewarder. Scripture says that if, if, if we're going to come to God, we must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, that God is a rewarder. Um, a rewarder as in good qualities bring about great benefits, like parenting. Uh, I reward my children. I don't negotiate with my children. My children can't make a deal with me. If I do this, Dad, you do that. You know, that sounds good. I like what you said you, I would get. Go do that now. Just go do that because I'm in charge. <laughs> there's, there's no deal. And if I feel like giving you the other thing, I may reward you. You know, but but what happens is 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 God God is a rewarder. He he's not you're not negotiating. It's like parents. He says, that's why he says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, he says it, that, because this is good behavior. This is a good practice. He says you know what happened? I I'll hear from heaven, and I will hear the, heal their lands. You know I will pour out. Uh, he just starts talking about all of the reward that comes from that. That if you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, this is not a negotiation. This is good behavior worth a reward. That if you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, he's going to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that there's not room enough to receive. This is not an exchange. This is a father watching his children progress in maturity and accomplishment and being proud and releasing to them according to his word. That, that if we obey these commands that he commands this day, attached to that good behavior, is you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the field, blessed coming and blessed going. That your kneading troughs and baskets will be blessed. Your herds and store, y'all get it, right? Oh, there's a lot of blessing because he's a rewarder. I mean, think about it. We got 14 verses of blessing for one verse of expectation. If you obey these commandments, I'm going to do, 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 do. It's crazy. And the great thing about it is God don't change. You know the problem that I have with, the, with, with people thinking that God has adjusted himself to the 21st century? <laughs> it, almost as if God showed up in this age like, whoo, never saw it coming. You know, is that, is, that, is that God himself doesn't change. He's the same yesterday. Today and forever. The Bible says he is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. That God does not change. He is the same God. The Bible says that God cannot tell a lie. I think that, uh, the New Testament says that the way he did it was that uh, uh, he swore on two immutable things or immovable things or unchangeable things. Uh, he swore on himself because there was nothing big enough for God to swear on and that God cannot tell a lie. This is what God established everything upon, himself of which there is no bigger and the fact that he cannot tell a lie. I have made the, the, the comment in here many a times that God is so much into not being able to tell a lie because he is truth that if he said something that we know to be untrue, by the time he finished saying it, particles will form that thing in the middle of the room so it will become true and we will be the lie. If God said that there is a pink elephant on a, on a polka dot ball, before the period on ball hit, we would be at the circus, and we would be like, oh, I must have been blind the whole time. God can't lie. He can't lie uh, because he's, he's, he's amazing, and he does not change. So what happens then, I'm, I'm trying to just, I'm laying a foundation because we're going these next couple Wednesdays, we're going to ride this thing. Do y'all feel the excitement? So, so what happens now is his word will never change. His word will never change. You know, the Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will endure forever. He says, he says that not one word will be taken away from the law until his return. He says all these things concerning his word. 
His word will never change. Uh, his word is not secular progressive. This is the problem that we have in this generation where we want to apply the adaptation of anything written solidly that, that, that we think that, well, they didn't know this era. And since they didn't know this era, we have to take what they said and make it fit to this culture. No, it's not secular progressive. It says what it says. Let me tell you, let me tell you the amazing thing about it. The reason we have to understand that God's word does not change and it is not subject to changing society and societal standards and preferences is this. Our God is omnipresent. I've explained this, I think, before. If not, I'll do it now really fast. But omnipresent just doesn't mean he's everywhere. It means that he's everywhere, all the time, at all times, at the same time. That's what omnipresent means. It doesn't mean that he's in right here and in China and there and space and here. It means that he's in all of those places right now, tomorrow, yesterday, in the beginning and in the end and all the time that we can't record that he's not, that he is omnipresent. This is why it's hard for us to understand God because we pray for healing. He says you're healed. The doctor still says I see it, but God's already stepped back or stepped up and took it out here. You just ain't arrived to where he's at. And not only that, he stepped back here and took it out your gene pool so your children don't have to get it either because he ain't bound like you bound. So in the omnipresence of God, with him being in all places at the same time, because everything is built upon him and upon his word that never changes, that if he ever stops saying something, saying a word about something, then that thing will cease to exist. So when God said, and I said this before many times, but when God said, let there be light, and then he stepped into day two and started changing the firmaments, he was still in day one saying, let there be light. And when he started day three and started separating the waters and the greater lights and lesser lights, he was still in day one saying, let there be light. And in day two, separating the firmaments, and when he went and started doing the animals, he was still here, 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 because if he ever stopped saying, let there be light, light would disappear. If he ever stopped establishing the firmament, the firmaments would disappear. And so God is in all places at the same time. So here's the problem with thinking his word is secular progressive. When he was saying it to be recorded, then he was standing here now. It wasn't like he was unaware that this was going to be happening. His word was for then and it was for now because he was in all of it when he said it. So his word will never change. And the great thing about that is that means that his promise is never revoked. That Nothing you can do can break his promise because his promise is not based on you. It's based on him. That when we are faithless, he is faithful. The great thing about his word not changing is that his commitments will always be kept. That if God committed to doing something, it's going to be done. Amen. That don't change because his word don't change. That, that his covenants are still in place. That any covenant he ever made is still in place because it don't change. It don't change because you ugly. <laughs> See how I point it that way? <laughs> if, it don't if it don't fit, you must have quit. I ain't talking to you. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but, but, but. Somebody say but. but. This is where things get sticky. This is where things start to move around because God is our father, not our uncle. Because, because that, and that means that we get gifts from him. All the gifts that he gives, we are entitled to those, but we also get discipline from him. Because he disciplines those that he loves. Uh, we get corrected. We get rebuked. We get reproved. We get established. I mean, he, he, he is our father. So we get responsibilities, which is why he said, I gave this one five, this one two, this one one, according to the own ability. Now, this one who got two made four. He's ruler of four cities because he was faithful with few things, is faithful with many. Responsibility comes. Promotion brings increased responsibility. Your father gives you responsibilities. You don't just get the coast. There's responsibility. 
Um, but in that responsibility happens, there's legacy, there's inheritance. We are, we are heirs of God. We are co-heirs of Christ. That no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. And that, that any tongue that rises against us in judgment, we shall condemn it. For this is our heritage and our vindication is in the Lord. That there, this all comes with a father. But we don't want Father God who art in heaven. We want Uncle God. And the reason we want Uncle God is because Uncle God, uncles come in for a good time. Uncles come in for a good time. They're, they're the same size as dad, maybe a little bigger than dad in our eyes. But they're, they're the cooler, funner one, and, and they make me feel good, and they make me laugh, and they tell all the good jokes, and, and they give me gifts too, and watch this, and they keep my secrets and don't hold me accountable. They won't tell, they won't, ain't going to tell dad of me. They're going to listen, and, and, and so they become the cool one. And, and here's the great thing about Unc is Unc got to go home. Unc comes in small bursts. Unc comes with limited uh, uh, tie-in. I don't have to be around him. He comes in small doses, and he expects nothing from me. Unc don't expect nothing from me. He advises me. He doesn't command me. So he may give me the same instruction that my dad gave me and may say, Dad's right, and you should do this, but it's just a suggestion, not a commandment. We want Uncle God. Instead of Father God. We want all the promises of God without the disciplines of God. We want, we want all, of, all of the love of God without the responsibility. And, and, and the problem is his word don't change. Watch this. This is where it gets sticky. It gets sticky here because we want God the surrendered, not God the king. We want him to come and surrender to us all of the gifts and all of the spoils and all of the blessings and give to us all that we want. We want him to bow down and serve us. We want God the subject, not God the Lord. <laughs> and since I'm in charge of my own life, give me what I want. He said, if I delight in you, you give me the desires of my heart. You give me all the stuff I want if I like you. That ain't what it said. You a lie and the truth ain't in you. Because this, this is where it gets sticky. Because God cannot lie, he operates in the bounds of what he has spoken. So if he said it, he did it. If he says it, he does it. Whatever he says and has established, even though he could wipe everything out and start over he submits to his own word because he cannot lie and if he did opposite of what he said he'd make himself out to be a liar so he's bound to what he said so when when he says that if we ask it will be given what happens then is people ask and they don't get it and they say either there is no god or that bible's not true or look at the contradictions but what the scripture actually says in proper translation is if you ask and keep asking, if you seek and keep seeking, if you knock and keep knocking, because what happens is, is it denotes the idea that what is happening if you ask and keep asking is that you are creating a prayer life. That your persistence in pursuing God for an answer creates a prayer life. That if you seek and keep seeking, you are developing a work ethic saying, God, I know you're going to bless the work of my hands, so I'm going to keep coming after and keep coming. After. I'm going to do my part to find it because you said if I seek you with my whole heart, I will find you, that, that you will be found by me. And so it, to, to knock and keep knocking denotes the idea that there is nothing that can stand in my way, that I will be so persistent, I will knock down every door because the Lord has opened for me and a effectual door. In fact, he is the sheep gate. So I'm going to knock this thing. It's a persistence that builds up. See, the way Jesus teaches it builds us into something. And, and we want the other thing. The problem is he operates within the word that he has spoken. And that means that there are times that he wants to bless us, but he can't. And you say, but God can do anything. But scripture says that when Jesus was in Nazareth, it says that, that they were like, oh, that's Joseph's boy, this night. And it said that he could not do many miracles. 
because a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. It didn't say he would not. It said he could not because there's times he want to, but he can't because he has to operate within his word. If there was no faith, if there was no expectation, if there was no honor, if there was no sowing, if there, then, then you don't get a miracle. Because the miracle is wrapped up in you and you being faithful to the word, unlocking the promises of the word. But not in you thinking I'm your magician. Jesus ain't no party prop. So this is kind of where it gets sticky. Because there's times he wants to bless us, but he can't. He, he wants to bless you, but you can't because you sowed sparingly. And to a giver who wants to give us life more abundantly... We can't be deceived by that, read that scripture and deceive ourselves because the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked what a man sows. That is what he reaps. If he sows sparingly, he reaps sparingly. Now, though he wants to give it to you abundantly, you have limited his hand. Uh, we, he wants to bless us, but he can't because we, he wants to forgive us for all of our unrighteousness, but because you won't forgive somebody. Because the word says forgive and you shall be forgiven. Forgive your brother and your father and heaven will forgive you. If you don't, he won't. Now, yes, the cross washes you in the blood and forgiveness is right there. And he wants to give it all to you at no cost to you, but you limit his hand. Some of our prayers don't get heard or we were disobedient or whatever the case we begin to limit because God operates so much within his word. That the Bible says that if a wife makes a promise to God and her husband hears her and says, you won't keep that oath, God releases her from that oath. You know why? Because God said that the husband was the head of the wife and he gave him dominion. So he honors his own word so much that he releases the oath made to him to maintain the order that he placed in the earth. Um, so this is where it gets sticky. Because God does not operate outside the bounds of his word because he is truth. And the enemy is a lawyer. Liar, I mean. No, I meant lawyer. The Bible describes him as the great accuser of the brethren. He is the prosecuting attorney. He, he wants to bring upon the believer guilty and con a guilty verdict and condemnation and shame. This is his role in the courts of God. Listen, he is an expert in the law. This is why the church struggles so much because the enemy always reminds you of the law. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. You're condemning you, accusing you, bringing evidence against your righteousness. What evidence can be brought against the blood of Jesus? Was there a Band-Aid that I didn't know about? No, no, no. So you're bringing evidence against me. You just forgot you weren't fighting me anymore, right? But this is what happens is, is the enemy is an expert in the law. And so he always reminds us of what the law says. Now, these laws, um, the laws, the Bible calls them as the law of sin and death. The enemy never talks grace. He only talks law. The only time that the enemy will try to even mention grace slightly is when it's on the bait stick to say, do everything you want. God will give you grace. And he's not talking grace. He's just trying to get you to move into bondage. And the law of sin and death, what the scripture says is that what the law was powerless to do, which was to forgive us of sin. And, and to, to relieve us of the debt, that it was powerless to forgive sin. So here's what the enemy is an expert in. In the law, which is strong enough to produce sin and death, but not strong enough to release us from sin and death. So he is an expert in bondage. It's a trap. The Bible says sin is a snare. The enemy, the enemy uses the word of God then, the law of God, the word of God to enslave and kill. Because it's strong, the law was strong enough to produce death and sin, but not strong enough to free us. So when, the, when it is in the enemy's hand, 
it is to enslave and kill. When it, when it is through God's hand, because Jesus said you can hang these two on the whole law, the whole law on these two, and that one, uh, one uh, rule of the law be taken. So he uses the law too, but in his blood, it's different. His covenant gives life. So, so the enemy only is able to bring sin and death or, or to try to slave and kill because the wages of sin is death. So if he can get you in there, with the, then, then there's a debt to be paid. Adam and Eve, um, the way that they come up in this whole situation is that he says, did God say? And they said, well, what God said was this. Oh, yeah, well, that won't happen. That won't happen. And gets them just enough manipulation in the word to fall into sin, but not enough revelation to repent when God comes walking. So, 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 so he can get them bound up and naked, but when they hear God, they didn't get enough out of it to say, go and bow down to the king. Rather, they went and hid from it. So he used the word of God to bring them into enslaving, and, and now they're going to die. He tried to do the same thing to Jesus um, and, and, and get Jesus to, he says, he says, throw yourself down from here. Isn't it written that he'll give his angels charge over you and they'll hold you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone? Uh, kill yourself. That's what he said. Kill yourself, and if your God is real, he'll catch you. Kill yourself. Heaven's waiting on you. This is, this is, this is what the enemy tried to do to Jesus, and Jesus said, yeah, 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 what you have, Scripture. He <laughs> said, let me tell you what the word of God say. You know, and, 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 and the word of God doesn't change. So it didn't work on Jesus. The enemy is a lawyer. The enemy is a lawyer, which the enemy is an expert negotiator. He is a negotiator. Say negotiator. Let me tell you about the enemy. He ain't scary. The enemy is not a scary thing. Man, the church for so long and even today still was tucking tail, running, ducking, scared of everything, moving, uh, in the middle of the night, hear some moving in the kitchen, and they pull the covers up. First off, if you don't jump up and get the oil out, oil in the left hand, pistol in the right, who in the kitchen? Who in the kitchen? All I know is I'm coming swinging both of them. We either going to have french fries when it's over or Swiss cheese, but something happening. Don't grease up everything and shoot up everything. Find out it was just the washer and dryer going off. <laughs> the enemy is not scary. He's a negotiator. He's the guy they bring in to talk when all the guys with guns don't know. That, I mean, we'll do the action, but we can't get the conversation. He, he's, a, he's a singer. Say singer. Singer. No, listen, the only singer I'm scared of. I ain't really scared of you either, but you a big dude. It's Darren. <laughs> I had but you right in the belly button. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, what am I talking about? He a singer, right? Listen, there were three made like him, the archangels. There was Lucifer, the angel of worship. There was Michael, the angel of warfare, and Gabriel, the angel of the word. Lucifer wasn't no warring angel. He a singing boy. Hey, David, where you keep them few sheep at? With your little, with your little notepad, write a little tune down. He was not the warring angel. So when we deal with spiritual warfare, you do understand that we can cast down every evil imagination. We can, we can tear down every stronghold, every principality, power, ruler of darkness, world, spiritual wickedness. You do understand we're dealing with a songstress. Now, Gabriel, Gabriel, he was the word. He could talk. Now, you got to watch out. You got to watch out because you never know. When you talk enough, sometimes you got to throw a punch. You talk yourself into some corner sometimes, and it's only one way out. So Gabriel might have halfway been able to get it in next to Michael. But this choir boy, Lucifer, and I say it like this because he was a singer.
I'm coming there. Don't preach my sermon. <laughs> Not only was he a singer, he was pretty. This is what the Bible say. The Bible say that he was beautiful, more beautiful than all the rest of them. That his, that his horns and timbrels made music when he flew. Light shined from within him, and in his garments was every precious stone named to man, from onyx and, and sapphire and gold and silver. Like, like, I mean, this is him. Oh, he was pretty. <laughs> Fresh fish, pretty. That boy was pretty. Like Chris Brown. Now, maybe, maybe Chris Brown can fight. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he can throw a punch and win something. Who knows? But, but here's, here's what I do know. As a singer, I'm just not intimidated. <laughs> I'm just not intimidated by no singer. And, and anybody, anybody from my neighborhood that was really like singing, you, at, you know, at the house party, you'd be like, yo, sing something. You're the entertainment. The biggest guy who can sing, except for you, Darren, except for you. <laughs> not you, not you. You like David. You like a warrior and a singer, Darren, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You a man after God's own heart. We ain't talking about, listen, we talking about everybody at another church and in the world. Nobody here. We riders here. I already know. I didn't already took you to a couple situations, so I, I know your reputation. Hashtag true story. <laughs> um. Maybe, maybe these singing boys can fight, but usually they off somewhere trying to hit a note and harmonize. And, you know, from the movies, they're around a barrel on the corner with some fire coming out of there, harmonizing it. You know what I'm saying? New Jack City style. I don't know. I just, I mean, I mean, I just, I, I don't, I, Bobby Brown, New Edition, Boys the Men. I, it's just, it's hard to be intimidated by singers. That is not a, that don't mean singers can't fight. I'm just saying that the Lord ain't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And so how do we walk around intimidated by the, less, the least intimidating of the three that were made? The prettiest one. You know, I mean, that's why today's mu music, it, it, I, I believe, let me, say, let me say that's why I believe, the reason why today's musicians have been groomed the way they have is the singers rap a little bit more. And they, now we got singing thugs that cuss and everything as opposed to love music and ballads because the enemy want to make the singer a little more intimidating. Uh, to quote Nelly, whoever said pretty boys can't be wild. And pause there. See, they don't know that. <laughs> but... That's what happens is, is, is there's a, a switch over because the devil wants you to be scared. Because this is what the Bible says about him in Luke 14. And this is Jesus. Excuse me. This ain't Luke 14. This is Isaiah 14. But it says, those who, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook the kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of the prisoners? That this is, when, when, when they see him, this is the impression. Is this the one? It's crazy to think that, that this negotiator is a fighter. No, he, he's, a, he's a runner, not a gunner. This is why scripture says, submit to Christ, resist the devil, and he will flee from you because he is a runner. He's a negotiator. He's a negotiator. He's a negotiator. This is why he didn't attack Eve and take her dominion. He had a conversation with her. He talked her out of it. This is why he didn't attack Jesus when he was starving for 40 days and weak in his weakest state. He, he tried to make deals with him. G, all Jesus' homeboys was back over there. He's out by himself in the middle of the desert and weak. This the time to, this, this the time to take him. This is when, this when you kill him. 
No, even in that condition, he had conversations with him, negotiated with him. This is why the Gadarene demoniac was uh, uh, was able to break chains with his strength, and he was uncontrollable, and people were scared of him. But when Jesus showed up, he did not run to the beach and swing on Jesus. He didn't offer Jesus a fight. He fell down before him, bowed to him, and started negotiating. Have you come before my time? Please, you know, just let us go into the pigs. The negotiating started because we're dealing with a singer negotiator, liar, lawyer, this is what we're dealing with. Um, so the thing, now here's what we got to be worried about. Because if the enemy can get us into a contract, get us to contractually agree to exchange or transfer to him what belongs to us, then he becomes the owner of it. Some of us got to be careful that we don't let the fighter in us do our negotiating. That we don't think everything is warfare and nothing is strategizing. Because the enemy will keep you on your defense and on your toes so that your adrenaline is running always in fight mode, that you make quick snap decisions and enter into the contracts that transfer things from your favor. But because he's a liar, he makes a good lawyer. Because he's a liar, he makes a good negotiator for his own self. Because he's a liar, he makes a good salesman. But he makes a bad deal for you. He makes a real bad deal. He had Eve believing that uh, he was giving her advice. And that she was in turn owing him nothing for his services. Free counsel. When the reality of it is he was giving her sin. And they gave up their dominion to him. That he gave them death in exchange for life. And he gave them the idea that they could rule themselves at the cost of their closeness to God. This was the bad deal they took because he's a good liar. So now here's God. God, who's bound to his own word, seeing us in this condition. He's bound to his own word and understanding that then the wages of sin is death. So he sees us in death now dying and he sees us bound up and he sees slaves where sons and daughters were. This is what he sees. And if he destroys the devil. To set us free. He has made a liar out of himself. Because since the wages of sin is death, a, a debt has to be paid for what has happened. And if he just wipes the devil out and sets us free, he has made a liar out of himself. And God cannot lie. In order for God to destroy the devil and to remain true to what he has spoken... In that current condition, he would have to destroy the devil and us. The devil and everything he owns and everything that he bound, that, that is contractually under his authority, which would include us. Because the enemy is a contractual owner and a debt has to be paid for the freedom. I love how amazing God is. What's the scripture we read last week? God didn't, hey, the devil got his time. You got a lake of fire coming. But until then, instead of destroying the devil, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. So, so, so what happens at this point is God, who is a giver, begins negotiating. God has never negotiated until this point. He said it, and it was. He said it, and it happened. He released it, and it came out. Now we see the giver negotiating. And seemingly, he is the worst deal maker ever. But he is the best father we have ever seen. He is, he is a great God who is greatly to be praised, even though his deal making was not good. The, the reason why we see his deal making doesn't appear to be as good and beneficial is because when you are a giver, you're not thinking about all that you can get for you. 
You don't want to argue about the details and try to swindle somebody. I think at the end of the day, take all that stuff. Just give me what I came for. Because givers don't make good uh, uh, negotiators because they're going to give away everything. As long as they leave with what they came for, they're happy. So the deal that God makes um, it's, 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 it, that he takes, he takes a bad deal. The enemy is a liar. He's a good negotiator. He makes a bad deal, and God takes a bad deal. Look, I know y'all, y'all don't like the sound of that. For your theology, let me help you out. Because y'all are like, no, it's the best deal. <laughs> no, it works for our good. But it wasn't, it would, it, no one would take that deal in any business conference room in the world. Here's the deal. The wages of sin is death. So somebody got to die. So, 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 so here is, is what happened. God says then, okay, I'll give my son, my only son, the only one, the, the, the only equal that I have, the only one who was with me in the beginning, before, before there was anything that was me, my son, and my spirit, uh, I'm going to give up him. He's never disobeyed me, and all of them have. And I'm going to give up him, and he's going to take their place. And if they believe him, I get them back. I get them back in a sonship from slavery. So the cost is, Jesus, you have to leave the throne. The cost is, Jesus, you have to experience betrayal. You have to experience denial. You have to experience death of friends, accusations, hatred, rumor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Loneliness, all these things. And even though you will never sin. You're going to be beaten to death until you are unrecognizable for people that you came to help. They're going to be the ones beating you. And in return for that, maybe they'll believe you. That's a deal. That's a horrible deal. There is nothing fair or equal about that deal. There is nothing that is, that's not fair compensation. That is being totally just like someone taking advantage of the situation. Someone knowing you're emotionally attached to the thing you want. Someone knowing the history of a thing. Somebody knowing how far you're willing to go because they know you personally. And now y'all on the outs. And they use, they, they use what they know against you. This is that kind of deal. God is, God is, he's, he, listen. He's a great giver, but whenever we see him negotiate, he negotiates not great deals. He says, I'll give you beauty for your ashes. That's an awful deal for you, God. <laughs> it's a great deal for me. You mean to, ta- you mean to tell me you're going to take my empty chip bag and give me a whole truckload of potato chips? <laughs> Absolutely. He says, I'm going to give you the oil of gladness for mourning. Give me your sadness, I'll give you gladness. This this is not great deals. These are the deals of a giver. So why pay so wildly or negotiate so poorly? One, I would say, I think the obvious answer is his love for his children. For God so loved the world. I mean, what wouldn't you pay for your kids? What train wouldn't you jump in front of? Bullet wouldn't you take for your children? So, so, so we see the love there. And then when you have a bajillion, gazillion, infinitillion dollars, <laughs> and they say that the ransom is $100 billion, you're like, sure, pay it. <laughs> this, is, this is God. Sure, pay it. I'm God. What are you going to do, kill me? <laughs> What grave will you put me in that I can't walk out of? What beating will you give me that, that, that I won't have a scar from? What is it you can do to me? I got a gazillion, bazillion, infinitillion dollars. I made that up, infinitillion. Put it in the book, M. <laughs> to get you home, he pay it. To get you, what you, were, get you to where you were born for, uh, he'd pay it to the place you're supposed to be in. He'd play it and pay it, and now he can go back to being the giver. He negotiated once and for all so that he can go back into being the giver. And now he says, as the giver, ask it in my name. 
and it will be given to you. He says, if you ask me, I'll give you this living water. He says, here are the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. He says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. God gives liberally to all without finding fault. Um, he says, as far as my presence goes, because in it there's freedom. So here's my presence. Where two or three of you gather, there you go, my, my presence. There's my presence. This is, this, is, this is now back to the giver that Jesus explains to us that in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you so. So I'm going now to prepare a place for you. He says, and then I'll come back again because I got to give it to you so that where I am, you can be also. I mean, he, he negotiated what we thought would look like a bad deal for him, but he just he said, let me get him back in a position so I can give back to him the way I created him. Um, Hebrews chapter 6 says, it has a verse that says, it says that when we continue to sin, it says, and I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to wrap this up. <laughs> you know what, Manny? Come play me something. But hurry up because I'm about to wrap it up. I might be, oh, there you go. I was going to say I might be done before you get from back there. Because <laughs> I'm just going to shut it down because if I keep going, I'm going to just keep going. Hebrews 6 says this. It says that when we continue to sin, it says we re-crucify Christ, bringing him back into public humiliation. Because every time the devil can talk us back out of his grace and can negotiate us back out of his promise and negotiate us back out of his freedom and back out of the dominion we walk in and put us back into bondage or back into victimization or back into sin, into death, into pain, into despair, into self-pity. Anytime that we allow the enemy to get us to exchange again, then our omnipresent God is back to the cross, renegotiating for you again. Having thought about this plan for all eternity, that this was a pre-thought out plan before the creation of man, because he had already lost the worshiper. And so he creates man differently than he created Lucifer, which is there was one of him, so there was pride found in him. But there's all of you, so you can't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And there was no plan for redemption for him because he was an angel. And so his act of rebellion was ultimately changing his nature. But for you, for us, there was a plan already in place for the redemption so that heaven would never be without a worshiper again. That no matter how far that you got away from him, he would come to bring you back in. Because if there were 99 on a hill and one wandered off, he would leave the 99 to go after the one. So he already had this plan thought out in eternity to secure you forever. He thought our eternity out while we don't second guess for a second, ignoring him for our preferences or simply being who he is as a giver. We just ignore all of that. And he continues to be a father and a blesser and the lover of our soul. And, and, and it's an amazing thing. But we have to be careful to not continue to exchange and have him renegotiate every time. The rich young ruler, and you'll hear this story over and over throughout these uh, things we're talking about because this is a year of rulership. You'll hear him over and over because he fits so many examples, but in, in this particular one, he comes up and he tells Jesus he wants the kingdom. We all know the story. The problem with him was he had a positioning problem is that he didn't see the value in exchanging his position for the position God wanted him to be in. So instead, he, 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 he exchanged what God had for him as a giver for what he already had in his hand. The Bible says he walked away because uh, he had much things, so he ended up with his much things and his church rule book and his, and his, his uh, kingdomless life. And he, he kept that position rather than the one that the giver wanted to give to him, which was Peter saying, what do we get? We left everything for you. Will you get a hundredfold in this day? 
and in the age to come because I'm a giver. Anyone who's left the house is going to get a hundredfold in this day. Anyone who's left the spouse is going to get a hundredfold in this day and the life to come because I'm a giver. And so this young man exchanged positions from being where God had appointed him because God is a giver to living outside of the grace and the giving of God and the creation of his own hand and the work of his own might because this was what the enemy tried from the beginning. You can by your own work be like God. This is where I'm going to stop. Where we're going to continue next Wednesday, if you're here, is we're going to walk through some of the exchanges. Because the exchanges we make that keep us from receiving what God is giving out is what we're going to expose. If God is a giver and we ain't getting it and our life is lacking or missing in some areas, then we are going to expose some of the exchanges that we make to stop us from receiving what God is giving out. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, because you are a giver. God, we thank you, Lord, that you...